Hello everybody, my name's Lottie and I make videos on a bunch of different things a lot of the time about mental health and also like commentary style things and today as you can see by the title we're talking about Trisha Paytas I've made a couple of videos about Trisha Paytas already and I'll link the playlist to those in the eye in the corner as well as in the description box down below and today we're going to be talking about her books I know, you're thinking, I didn't know Trisha had books that's because she was doing it before it was cool, okay? So I bought three of Trisha Paytas' books the first one I think was released in early 2013 and it's called The History of My Insanity the second one is called The Stripper Diaries I think was released in late 2013 or early 2014 and then I bought this one which was released in 2014 and it's called curvy and loving it although this one I'm not actually talking about so much in this video well at all in this video because um it's not really it's not really relevant to be honest sorry Trisha today we're very much going to be talking about these two books this one is a more autobiographical memoir style and this one is taken from diary entries that Trisha wrote when they were actually working as a stripper and they're just like compiled into a book. When I started reading the stripper diaries I was thinking okay this is apparently meant to be real diary entries I don't think it is I think it's like just like a made-up story but actually going back on Trisha's YouTube channel they used to have a series called the stripper diaries where they would make videos and they would read out these diary entries from an actual notebook. Well and like I said I don't know if they're that interesting to you guys too they kind of are getting more depressing they're not really the funny entries that I used to have and three I know a lot of people are like I don't know hesitant to believe this things happen but actually and it kind of like offended me thinking like I lived through these things and you have the audacity to not say that I did but then I was thinking you know what for those who who are aware that these things happen or maybe that aren't aware but they hear these stories and think that they could happen they could happen they could happen to you they happen to me um whether people want to believe them or not so I decided to share another ship of diaries with you guys just because I really I feel like they can if they help one person not become a dancer, or like, I think it's a good thing. So I think these are real. Like I'm definitely leaning towards these diary entries being real and written in real time. But don't worry, we're gonna get into all of the discussions around Trisha Paytas being a liar and all sorts of things. So just a couple more things before we start. This video is kind of like a part one. I'm coming out with another Trisha Paytas video. Tr Trisha Paytas video in a couple of days. If you're watching this way after the upload date it should already be uploaded and the link will be in the description. In this video I'm very much talking about what I have found in the books, the history of Trisha, the evolution of Trisha, how Trisha has got to where they are today. And in, in the second video, I'm actually going to be going through in chronological order, talking about every one of Trisha's controversies online and giving my thoughts and opinions on them. Because if you've watched my previous videos about Trisha and the frenemies drama, then you'll know I, I'm definitely in the minority of when it comes to opinions on Trisha Paytas. And the reason I thought it would be a good idea to make this video about Trisha's books and not just go straight into the timeline is because I think, and I think you'll agree with me, Trisha is one of the most controversial figures on the platform. They are generally very disliked. I thought it would be interesting to go back and just get to know Trisha a little bit more past what we see on YouTube. Get to know things that happened in their childhood, in their teen years. And as this book so eloquently depicts on the front cover, she's in a straight jacket. <laughs> the trials and tribulations Trisha has had with their mental health and like how those things developed. I think people have very like definitive and hardcore views on Trisha that I think are sometimes, I'm gonna honest, I think sometimes they're misguided. I think sometimes you guys have got a point. But sometimes I think things that I said about Trisha are really unfair. And that's essentially why I'm making this video and my next video. We're going to be discussing all the controversial things like Trisha's gender, Trisha's diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, Trisha's potential pathological lying, their self-diagnosis of dissociative identity disorder. We're going to be getting into all of like the juicy stuff. I hate to even say juicy because it's like it's Trisha's life but here we are. So without further ado let's learn a little bit about Trisha's background before we get into the controversies in the next video. Down, yeah. I've been feeling so, I've been feeling Trisha so. was born on the 8th of May 1988, yeah. making them a Taurus in Riverside, California, but spent their early years living in Illinois with their mom, dad, and older brother. Trisha was three years old when their parents got divorced. Trisha's dad moved to LA where he continued to become very wealthy, while Trisha, their mom, and their brother stayed in Illinois and were not very well off at all, according to Trisha. Trisha and their older brother did fly out to LA to visit their father regularly, about three times a year. So every now and again, they would have access to this temporary 
lavish lifestyle with their dad. But most of the time they were in Illinois, kind of broke with their mom. And I think it's really interesting that very early on in Trisha's life, they were kind of swinging between these two extremes, not of their own choice, obviously. Trisha's dad got remarried and they weren't overly keen on the stepmom, while Trisha's mother had a series of boyfriends, one of them being the father of Trisha's half-sister, Callie. When Trisha got to middle school, which I believe is around 12 to 15 years of age for my UK viewers, because we don't really have middle school here, Trisha started to get repeatedly picked on for being fat. And not only that, but she was kind of ostracized from her peer group for all these random trips to LA that their family would take. It kind of seemed like the kids at school were jealous of this, or at least jealous of Trisha's dad's wealth. Trisha always loved Hollywood and the idea of entertaining, but in middle school, this is where it became really strong. And they would perform in school plays and events, but most of the kids kind of thought they were just extra and a bit weird. Another thing that probably contributed to Trisha feeling ostracized from their peers was around middle school age is when Trisha started to become preyed on by a lot of older men, or at least this is what it says in the book. I don't think this book is has everything that's ever happened to Trisha in it. I'm positive that there are things that they left out. But according to this timeline, at least, is when Trisha started experiencing inappropriate things with school teachers. And this would have undoubtedly impacted Trisha's sense of self-worth and identity. Trisha said, male attention was great and my teachers were hot. My fantasies went wild about teacher-student affairs. They always fascinated me, and for the first time in my life, men wanted to be around me, wanted me to be with them, and not just for holidays and summer. Trisha started lying a lot in their teenage years, and this is something they've talked about quite openly on YouTube as an adult, talking about how they used to tell stories of being an extra in a certain movie, or that their mother dated a certain musician. And I think we all knew a kid in school who made up the most ridiculous lies, and no one believed them, but they just continued to tell them, and sometimes just they got bigger and better as time went on. And I think when you're a kid, stuff like that is funny. And to be honest, it's kind of funny now as an adult still. But at the same time, I don't think the seriousness of a young person lying that often should be downplayed. Kids and adults obviously do this because they feel a deep sense of inadequacy and an intense need to be accepted and honestly, that's just really sad. I also think the fact that Trisha is forthcoming about the fact they used to lie like this, kind of makes things they say now as an adult more credible. I know some people would disagree with that and they'd be like, well, if they're admitting to lying, what's stopping them from lying now? But I think that's, I think that's just my point is that if they were still a liar now, they wouldn't be admitting to being a liar back then. Does that make sense? They wouldn't want to be admitting to lying at all if they were still doing it now. Trisha took a lot of inspiration from media and movies, and one of their biggest influences at this time was Kelly Kapowski from Saved by the Bell. And as Trisha grows up, we'll see that there are people that she idolizes or chooses to take on personality traits of that person. Trisha bounced around schools a bit, which didn't help their already existing issue of connecting to kids their age. And at one point, Trisha actually went to live with their dad out in LA to continue taking acting classes out there, but she also had to enrol at a high school. We already saw the beginning stages of Trish cultivating this glamorous Hollywood-esque persona during school in her small Midwestern hometown, and that was a way of trying to be accepted. But Trish felt that this same persona wasn't going to quite cut it now that they were actually in LA, because everyone is glamorous and rich there. My angle this time was that I was a farm girl who'd never been to a real school before. I presented myself as Ellie Mae from the Beverly Hillbillies, and that was my character. During high school, Trisha also did online education at home for a bit, as well as dropping out altogether for six months, suffering badly with depression and emotional overeating. After briefly living in LA, Trisha moved back in with their mother in Illinois. This period of Trisha's life, at least from the book anyway, seemed quite chaotic and unstable. At the last school Trisha moved to before graduating high school, their persona shifted again. Less farm girl now, more highly sexualized, ditzy child actor. I started sexing myself up a little more. My mom bleached my hair a brassy blonde, I think with all my razzle-dazzle, people didn't notice my weight. I dropped about 30 pounds though, by not eating for two weeks straight, and that helped. Another pop culture influence on Trisha was The Simple Life with Paris Hilton and Nicole Ritchie. And in Trisha's own words, she began playing up the dumb blonde persona because of this influence. This is also around the time that Trisha discovered they could talk really, really fast. And even though they weren't close with other teenagers at school, sometimes kids would ask Trisha to read from textbooks in class, and this made Trisha feel accepted in some way. One of Trisha's mom's boyfriends was being particularly creepy around this time as well. And I don't know how Trisha feels about it now, but in 
the book in Trisha's writing. It does seem like they felt their mom was choosing men over them. And that was a big factor in Trisha moving back to LA with their dad after they'd graduated high school. From Trisha's writing, it really felt like they spent their entire teen years having to choose between the lesser of two evils when it came to their parents. So now you've been reading all about my broken home and thinking, Trish, you were never murdered or beaten, so consider yourself lucky. You may be right, my parents loved me and wanted the best for me. I believe that deep down, but my own psyche really was my own worst enemy. My peers hated me because I was different. My dad hated me, so he left me. My mom hated me, so she pushed me out. My sister hated me because we weren't full-blooded siblings. I just had so many thoughts of people hating me in my head that I didn't feel I deserved to be loved by them, nor did they deserve my love. There's a lot of things that can create a personality disorder, but emotional neglect, adverse childhood experiences, trauma, abuse and abandonment in our formative years are very big components to what makes up BPD. So Trisha's dad was very wealthy this entire time, but I don't know if he was a millionaire, but now he was. And he had a really nice house out in LA where Trisha stayed in the guest house, rent free while going to community college full time, still pursuing acting and working a job at Target. Trisha's dad and stepmom were also on the more conservative side and went to church a lot. Now this is an era of Trisha Paytas that becomes a little bit more familiar to us. Down, yeah. I've been feeling so, I've been feeling so. And this is where MySpace was the place to be. Trisha actually started out seeking popularity on MySpace and gained thousands of friends within months and only started making YouTube videos so their MySpace fans could see more of them. Trisha's first video on YouTube was them wrapping Ice Ice Baby by Vanilla Ice. What an icon. This is about the time that Trisha found the TV and film section of Craigslist where castings would be posted. And this is how Trisha booked their first TV job on the Greg Berent show. Berent? Brent. Berent. I don't know how you say it. It got cancelled after the first season and there's honestly not that much online that I could find about it, but I think it was like a talk show. Greg Berent is the co-author of He's Just Not That Into You and a writer on Sex in the City. And Trisha was cast because they wanted to do a segment on this sort of plastic valley girl who was obsessed with looks. So when Trisha applied, she knew exactly what they wanted and basically moulded herself to become the person they were looking for. Trish, how you been? Well, they want to know what's going on. The kids have been writing me. They write me on my MySpace page. They say, where's Trish? How can I get a hold of her? Can I go out with her? She's so beautiful. Uh, I always get, I'm annoying. I hated you on the street. You're so annoying. <laughs> so. <laughs> Trisha's dad and stepmom weren't supportive of them doing these TV appearances. Like I said, they were quite conservative and really valued education and image and thought that Trisha was dumbing herself down to be on these shows. So because of that, Trisha decided to drop out of college, move out of her dad's house and into an apartment on Hollywood and Highland with the help of their mother. So as we can see, there's kind of this pattern where Trisha falls out with one parent and then the other parent takes over the parental duties. And it must have been really hard for Trisha to be batted between the two constantly. I've been feeling so, I've been feeling so. As Trisha had quit their day job at Target and the yeah. Greg Berent show had got cancelled, Trisha was struggling for money in the new apartment, especially as they developed a bit of a shopping habit and weren't very good at saving. And during this time as well, Trisha was having a lot of sex and it wasn't exactly in the healthiest of circumstances. I felt loved because a guy wanted to be with me for a couple of hours. So I went from guy to guy having casual sex to feel better about myself and my situation. Impulsive shopping and excessive spending, as well as unsafe sex and using relationships to fill a void are classic characteristics of borderline personality disorder and of course those things can exist outside of borderline obviously but when you start to learn more about Trisha's struggles it becomes really hard to say that they're lying about having this condition. Trisha met a man called Brian on MySpace who was a personal assistant to Alice Cooper. They went on a few dates and Trisha didn't really like him like that and speaks about her struggle with boundaries. I did go back to his apartment out of politeness. Being overly polite is a bad habit of mine. I can't say no to people. Brian knew that Trisha was looking for work and suggested getting a job as a stripper. Trisha said that they did not have the confidence to think of this themselves, but someone who was in show business suggesting it to her kind of boosted her a little bit. Trisha worked at several different strip clubs to earn an income while also looking for acting. 
acting work as well as dressing up in superhero costumes with her neighbour and performing in character with him on Hollywood Boulevard. This is how Trisha ended up appearing on Jimmy Kimmel Live. Trisha found themselves getting emotionally attached to certain clients, particularly older men who reminded them of their father. One of these men wanted to tie Trisha up and there just seems to be no boundaries or protection in this job at all, which I think caused a lot of confusion around what stripping actually is and what type of sex work Trisha wanted to engage in. And I mean, they really had no guidance going into that industry at all. In both the history of My Insanity and The Stripper Diaries, we hear Trisha mention feeling like she has to do certain things. And we've already heard a bit about the struggle of saying no. But I think a lot of these times in the strip clubs, especially Trisha didn't realize that no was an option. And along with that, there's also a little bit of slut shaming sprinkled throughout the books. Trisha slut shaming other sex workers, but also themselves. And that makes perfect sense to me considering the shame that I think Trisha is carrying or was carrying at the time of writing these books, particularly as she was intending to just do stripping. And then the sexual acts that kind of followed were illegal for one, but also incredibly normalized in the culture of the strip clubs. And a lot of the time Trisha didn't identify with being a full service sex worker because technically they were just employed as a dancer. And if the police ever asked, they were definitely just a dancer. So anyway, this guy who wanted to tie Trisha up eventually did and Trisha had to be taken to hospital because of the extent of her injuries. And that's not the only time Trisha talks about being attacked. They were assaulted at numerous strip clubs multiple more times. The way that they write about it makes it sound like it was just a regular occurrence, including once by a club owner at an audition. There are some really disturbing entries in the stripper diaries in particular. There's also a lot of discourse throughout the stripper diaries surrounding morals and self-worth in sex work. And I think Trisha's shame and confusion about what's happening, as well as lack of mentorship or guidance is reflected in those moments. Do strippers deserve to be Is it part of our job? Is it if you tease? I'm numb. There was another really traumatic incident where a customer offered Trisha a lift home and them in his car. Trisha says that writing about this in the history of My Insanity is the first time they'd ever talked about it and they believed at the time anyway that it was their punishment for being a stripper. I don't think I even need to say how horrific and upsetting it is that Trisha had to go through that. And all of these incidents help to explain why Trisha doesn't like going to certain spots in LA because these locations remind them so much of these traumatic events. And then here's another thing, you know, we bought a whole new studio that we're in right now. She says she doesn't want to come all the way to downtown LA, or she says she has trauma about downtown LA, she doesn't want to be here, whatever. Or she says she has trauma about downtown LA, she doesn't want to be here, whatever. It can also explain why Trisha is so on edge about driving and being in parked cars. Trisha explains that due to some of these assaults, they became hardened to men. And to the customers in the strip clubs, they would essentially manipulate them to buy lap dances, saying things like, I have kids at home to feed, which obviously was not true. And this was a big difference in Trisha's behavior because in the books, they describe not being a very good stripper. Like they could never actually close a sale and get the customers to pay for dances. But later Trisha became so numb that stripping became easier for them. A lot of dancers that Trisha worked with used drugs and although Trisha says that sometimes they would use alcohol to get through the shifts at work they would never use drugs. Never took drugs, never wanted to. I have such an addictive personality I'm scared I'd get addicted and couldn't stop. I can't stop searching for love, can't stop eating, can't stop shopping and for a while there I couldn't stop having sex. I find this quote in particular really interesting because Trisha is kind of foreshadowing their own substance abuse issues they go on to encounter later on in life. Trisha does go on to contradict herself in the stripper diaries. This was obviously taken from entries of Trisha's diaries so it was written before the history of my insanity but it was published after i'm pretty sure either way it doesn't really matter but my point is that trisha does contradict themselves and i don't know why that is i don't know if it's because trisha just couldn't bring themselves to be honest in this book about their substance abuse because well no one wants to admit that they're a drug addict do they so i suppose it could have been trisha's 
shame or embarrassment stopping them from writing about it in this book, even though they mention it quite frequently in the stripper diaries. Or it could just be that Trisha dissociated or blacked out because that is something that Trisha deals with. And I know that that can kind of be frustrating as a reader or a viewer. It was kind of jarring reading these two books back to back and having them differ on something quite massive like substance abuse. But given everything we know about Trisha's life so far and everything that we'll go on to talk about in this video, I really don't hold this contradiction against Trisha at all. I don't know, it's just not not a big deal to me. Down, yeah. I've been feeling so, I've been feeling Eventually so Trisha quit down, stripping yeah. as they got an offer to be on the second season of a reality TV show with Stan Lee called Who Wants to Be a Superhero? And this dumb blonde persona that we've seen Trisha cultivate over time proved to be successful yet again when booking this job. And it's so interesting to me because by Trisha's account they were good at school and also by their dad's account because remember a few minutes ago we talked about how Trisha's dad felt they were dumbing themselves down but the thing is they are malleable in the sense that they can adopt this act, this persona quite easily. Trisha left the show realizing they had a knack for being this character. They could play this dumb, blonde, spoiled valley girl persona really well. And although what Trisha really wanted was to be loved and adored, being the center of attention was enough to fulfill this need, even if the attention was negative. From Trisha's writing, this persona that they'd been building since middle school at times seemed a very conscious thing. Like on Who Wants to Be a Superhero, Trisha knew they were going on to play a hyper feminine ditzy young girl but at other times it seemed like Trisha didn't know how or where or when to turn this character off and when they're turning it off what exactly is going to be there underneath. It's almost like Trisha had spent so long creating Trisha the persona that they forgot to create Trish the person. Another symptom of borderline personality disorder is identity disturbance or unstable sense of self and self-image. Trisha has talked about this a lot in recent years and honestly I think if people gave just a little bit more compassion towards understanding this symptom I don't think Trisha would get half as much hate or criticism as they do. I know that's a bold statement but that's what I believe. And I'm gonna talk a lot more about this in my part two video, so stay tuned. There was a gap of time between filming the ending of Who Wants to Be a Superhero and when it aired on TV. And during that period, Trisha did have to go back to stripping, this time at a new club. And what Trisha describes as a famous one mentioned in Motley Crue songs off the Sunset Strip. Trisha met a lot of very rich and famous celebrities here and ended up becoming kind of like an unofficial escort, as well as a dancer. A couple thousand dollars may not seem like a lot to have sex, and why would these Hollywood hotshots have to pay you to have sex? They don't. They pay for you to leave. Trisha was still making YouTube videos and around this time is when their channel turned into a bit of a shrine to Quentin Tarantino. We can see themes all throughout Trisha's life of being obsessed with celebrity and success and stardom. And even nowadays, Trisha is so on the ball with anything pop culture. Trisha's YouTube videos at this time actually caught the attention of the Quentin Tarantino team and they invited Trisha to an event at the New Beverly Cinema where she could actually get to meet Quentin Tarantino. Trisha says this is when they really started to understand the power of YouTube. They also said that Quinton was really nice and genuine and they met him at several other events over the years. Trisha was also getting some more TV jobs and being booked on talk shows such as The Price is Right. And finally, because, oh, there you go. You want to say hi to anybody? Hi, you. Can you hear me now? If you remember during this period, Trisha is on good terms with her mum, but not their dad. As far as I was concerned, my dad was the reason I got my dad was the reason I'm stripping. My dad was the reason I couldn't hold a relationship together. Of course, as I write this, I understand he wasn't the reason. I made those choices, but you have to wonder, did I make those choices because I was born with something a little off in my mind or because of the way I was raised? I don't want to make the same mistakes with parenting when I have children, if you can call them mistakes. And I don't know, it could just be me, but I just think that smacks of self-awareness. I think it's incredible that Trisha can have these thoughts and feelings about their dad while observing that they may not be completely rational, but they don't dismiss them. Trisha stands firm in the belief that their dad hurt them while acknowledging that he's a human being too. After months and months, Who Wants to Be a Superhero finally aired and Trisha and the rest of the cast were getting booked regularly to go to comic book conventions. It was kind of fascinating to read about Trisha's experiences of being a reality TV star at these comic cons and how nerdy men are the most judgmental in Trisha's opinion. There were a lot of older male actors at these conventions who'd been in TV shows that were successful years ago and Trisha continued this familiar pattern of forming relationships with them and then 
becoming attached to these men. Trisha spent the weekends jetting off to these conventions and the weekdays stripping and escorting. They talk about how they were regularly having unprotected sex with multiple partners per day and was hardly eating during this time and really had no support system at all. And at the end of that year, Trisha was rushed to hospital with viral hepatitis and dehydration. It was Trisha's dad who dropped everything to take care of Trisha and then cared for them at his house afterwards. So this ended the period of them two not talking and Trisha said even though they had their issues, this really solidified that her dad cared for her. Trisha was obviously struggling to take care of themselves and to be safe, so their dad suggested coming back to live with them and enrolling in college again, as they'd done before. But this time, Trisha's dad would actually pay Trisha to go to college as well as paying for college itself. He obviously did this because he really wanted Trisha to get a degree and could see it never been really appealing to her. So now there was a financial incentive as well. Trisha also restarted communication with their mum and sister Callie and mentions how those relationships strengthened as well, even though they weren't in the same state. There seems to be these massive ebbs and flows in Trisha's life where things are going really, really well or really, really bad. And there's a thing with borderline personality disorder where sometimes people can feel uncomfortable in stability and security. It's usually because our early years were so chaotic that it's kind of what our brains have gotten used to. So when life is being pretty stable, it feels boring it feels mundane and sometimes subconsciously we start looking for new ways to make it exciting again. Trisha told their dad they'd picked up a job working night shifts at a funeral home but actually had gone back to stripping and escorting. I was also praying for direction, the biggest constant prayer of my life. I'm always struggling to find where I'm supposed to go in life. I really want to make God happy and I also want to make myself happy. Why is this so hard for me? I think religion and morality are also themes we see popping up for Trisha time and time again and this might be partially influenced by their father's Catholic faith. Since writing these books we've seen Trisha talk openly about religion on YouTube but because of their history of online trolling which we'll talk more about in part two and because of the campy performative imagery Trisha puts forth about their faith a lot of the time I think people think Trisha's being insincere whereas I think it's quite obvious that Trisha has had a bit of a mental battle around God and Christianity and right and wrong and good and evil. Something that I think ties in here is Trisha's knowledge of popular tropes in fiction and the search for an identity. The stripper who found God, the escort who was saved by a rich man, the young naive yet sexy young woman who slept her way to the top of Hollywood. These are all fairly common tropes within movies and media and we all know Trisha's a big pop culture fan so I suppose if you're someone who is constantly searching for an identity it makes sense to play with these tropes that have been done before and not only have they been done before but they've been done before glamorously on screen a lot of the time with a happy ending. Not that type of happy ending you sicko. It's like searching for a new coat when you don't have one you're going to go into a shop and try on ready-made coats before you start sewing your own. Trisha continued to get booked on talk shows and even won $10,000 on a game show to do with stocks and shares that their father preps them for beforehand. Despite Trisha's relationship with their father improving, their life in his house felt very stifled and controlled. And since Trisha was close again with their sister and mother, the three of them decided to move into an apartment together. After playing the fat Jessica Simpson in Eminem's We Made You music video, Trisha's YouTube channel was getting more traction and they were also getting booked for more TV work without trying as hard as before. However, Trisha continued to strip and escort and generally be quite reckless with their safety. I felt worthless. I felt like this was my life and I had to accept it. I've often been questioned by my family and a few boyfriends if I'm bipolar. The truth is that I'm not. I've sought out therapists and psychiatrists and both just think I've experienced some traumatic events, but I'm not bipolar. I've been feeling so, I've been feeling so After a long while of not working any comic cons with the Who Wants To Be A Superhero cast, Trisha picked up some dates and met a man there who I think is Anthony Michael Hall from The Breakfast Club, I think. I'm pretty sure it is. Trisha doesn't say his name explicitly in the book. So they met and spent the weekend together and basically Trisha doesn't say this word, but this is what it is. He basically love bombed her and he even said I love you to Trisha on the first day. And 
their relationship was a complete toxic on and off whirlwind. I think Trisha even has a few YouTube videos about this relationship. If you don't want to read the books, you can go and find out about it there. This guy basically cheated on Trisha all the time, lied constantly, was manipulative. He discarded Trisha multiple times, which always left her feeling like shit. One of the times after they'd been apart, he actually forgot who Trisha was and Trisha had to remind him with a photo. He just sounds like trash. So during this tumultuous relationship, Trisha's attitude towards stripping and escorting shifted a little bit. I was looking for love and acceptance, but I was also looking for guys to take advantage of, even though they would think they were taking advantage of me. I got these guys to fall in love with me and then just change my number and never talk to them again. There, how do you like being abandoned? Don't get me wrong, that's mean. That is mean behavior. I think everything that we know about Trisha so far, it would make sense though as to why they would find power in behaving like that. By now Trisha was entering their mid-20s and was able to get by financially on YouTube money as well as taking a few TV jobs here and there. The Ellen DeGeneres show and America's Got Talent had seen Trisha's YouTube videos and wanted them to be on the shows for their fast talking talent and of course those opportunities opened up a lot of doors as well. The last couple of chapters in this book revolve really heavily around this trash man that Trisha is dating. And I don't want to downplay the significant role that this relationship obviously had in Trisha's life. At the time of writing this book, Trisha said he was the only man that she's ever been in love with. But he literally treated her like shit. It's a textbook toxic relationship. I think anyone would be able to tell you that. You don't have to be a genius. And it makes me really sad because vulnerable people, especially like Trisha was, are particularly susceptible for falling for manipulative people and toxic cycles. Especially those with borderline personality disorder, they're kind of used to this chaotic toxic cycle from childhood, but also they desperately seek love and validation. So this makes abusers and manipulators just hone in on them. Eventually things ended between Trisha and this garbage man thankfully, but of course it ended with him calling them crazy. How else would a toxic relationship end? Down, yeah. I've been feeling so, I've been feeling and after this relationship, down, Trisha sought therapy yeah. for the first time and found it to be really helpful. They speak quite highly of therapy towards the end of this book, which I think is a really positive message for quite a dark book. Around this time is when Trisha moved into their own place, the beach house that a lot of us might remember from their older videos. And the book ends with Trisha in a financially stable place, still in therapy and celibate for eight months. I'm no longer seeking love, but if love finds me, I will not be afraid. I'm slowly learning to trust people again. Even if someone has broken my trust, I will not hold that against the next person who comes into my life. I think that's a really healthy, positive way of looking at things. And I'm really glad that Trisha felt like that, at least at some point during their life. And you might be thinking, well, since the book, Trisha has backtracked on that a couple of times. And yeah, I think so too. But mental illness is a tricky thing. Personality disorders in specific are so hard to move on from because they're patterns and habits that are so deeply ingrained within you. But we'll talk more about that and more about Trisha's life after these books in the part so there you have it guys I hope you enjoyed this video and getting to know a little bit more about Trisha a little bit more than what we see on YouTube I for one found it fascinating I would read like 10 of these books about Trisha's life I think they're very clearly a person who's had a very like tumultuous life and experienced a lot of different things and I always like hearing about people's life experiences in general and I think Trisha's is just really interesting so I hope you enjoyed this video please stay tuned for the second part where I'm going to be talking about different scandals that Trisha has and I'm going to be going through in chronological order and talking about every single thing that I think people um, take issue with Trisha about. Like and share this video if you enjoyed it, subscribe if you want to see the part two or any other videos that I put out and I'll see you in my next video. Bye! Down, yeah. I've been feeling so, I've been feeling so down, yeah.